Welcome all. Dobar dan. It is the second day of the online event, The Future of Publishing, organized by Belletrina Publishing House, along with the Center for Creativity at the Museum for Architecture and Design. The New Approaches is the title of today's presentations. We have three distinguished guests with us today. Rüdiger Wischenbart, world-known expert on publishing and new approaches in publishing. Rüdiger follows statistics in the area of book sales, translations. He's an advisor in the area of international publishing markets, development strategies, and lecturer with the University of Vienna. In Vienna, he will be joined by his co-worker, Michaela Fleischhacker, also an author and specialist in publishing. And here in Ljubljana, we are joined by an author, publisher, editor, and professor in Ljubljana University, Micha Kovac. Micha, hi. Hello. Hello. Welcome all. And welcome, of course, dear audience. Important point. We definitely wouldn't like this to be one-way communication. So please ask questions, send us remarks. You can do all that also via uh, chat, if you wish. I will very attentively check the chat box in hope of your response. And I will personally make sure that all your questions will actually get answers. Just a small remark. It would be nice, of course, if you could turn the video on. This is not just for the sake of my curiosity, who is with us today, but it's so much nicer to see who you are actually talking to. Um, but remain muted, of course, um, unless you want to ask a question. We will begin right here in Ljubljana with Micha. So, Micha, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we will take a short walk through the changes which took place in publishing and uh, what we would like to show is that the publishing claim landscape changed entirely in last few years and at least for those who were used to stable publishing models this this change this change is huge and it it brings a lot of new things to to, to the world of publishing it, it brings a lot of cha challenges and what we will want to show today is that we can to an extent survive these challenges the main issue which took place in publishing is that we are facing a comp competition which is tougher than it ever was not only because the book production exploded, but also because the production of media content exploded. Uh, regarding the book production, um, th there is the change which took place in the last 50 years in, is fundamental. If we, do a sh if we take a short look to the history, uh, in 400 years, between 15th and 19th centuries, around 10 million book titles were published then in 20th century this number started to grow rapidly predominantly thanks to changes in media technology in printing technology and of course th thanks to changes in uh, enrollment to education in 20th century around 170 million titles were published 17 times more than in previous 400 centuries. If we look at today's data, there is around 600,000 published yearly in European Union. In uh, United Kingdom, which is not part of European Union, they publish 300 titles per day. And in Slovenia, uh, we published in 1953, when we produced the first decent statistics of book production, we published two titles per day. And in 2020, this number grew to 14,000 titles per day. Similar numbers are valid also for uh, Croatia, and quite similar uh, numbers are valid for, for other small uh, East European countries. So, we produce 14 books per day and th th this is huge th this is bigger than any person could could follow why did this change happen technically the explanation is quite simple in 1970s uh, production costs for printing a fiction title equaled a price of a small car 
And due to the high printing cost, it was practically impossible to print um, such a book in less than 1,000 copies. So we had very strict limit. If you wanted to enter the book market, you had to have enough money to print uh, the, the, the book, and you couldn't do it less than in 1,000 copies, what meant that the publisher had to have organized distribution. And in this kind of environment, it was practically impossible, economically impossible, to self-publish books or to print books in small quantities. In 2020s, this the price of producing a book, book uh, title decreased enormously. Now we can print a book for the cost of a bicycle, not an expensive bicycle, uh, uh, let's say a, 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 a mid-priced bicycle. And what is even more important, there is no print runner limit. limit. We can print 100 copies, 200 copies, even 50 copies. And this, of course, opened the gate for for printing a lot of uh, uh, additional book titles which in previous eras when book publishing required high, high investment were impossible to publish or the, uh, the publishers didn't want to take risk to publish them and today uh, if we publish ebooks the price is even lower a production cost for an ebook equal the price of a bicycle seat or a bicycle ring, or it's the production could be even free if we do it uh, at home and if the uh, published book doesn't require a lot of uh, 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 graphical components. Um, the consequence of this is that the self-publishing of books exploded. All those authors who were in 70s, 80s, and 90s rejected by publishers and editors started to self-publish, and many of them were very successful in this enterprise. They sold enormous amounts of books. In addition, the entire publishing landscape started to change. There is a lot of content which we call books, but they don't look like books. They don't look at all because they are intangible. They are electronic products. We have, of course, good old fashioned electronic books, which are electronic editions of printed books. But on the other, other hand, on Wattpad, we have huge amounts of stories which are produced by enormous amount of, of, of uh, youngsters, predominantly youngsters, who write their fantasies there and some of them later on become successful authors published in the book format but many of them just remain there similar story is with fan fiction net where a lot of uh, fan fiction is being published which never moves to to to, to printed format and then of course we have new formats in audio which is uh, gaining the momentum all around the, the the world beside this we have two huge conglomerates amazon which is extremely successful global book selling printed book print book selling and uh, ebook selling company and then we have in china we have tencent which is huge media corporation amazon size uh, which also produces ebooks uh, for for their customers. They, they have around 200, more than 200 million users using their, their platform in China. Uh, in addition, for most of us, books are only one click away. Uh, Amazon has uh, its enormous uh, warehouses, of course, from which they ship all around the, the, the world. But in our part of the world, smaller pub publishers are following up. In Ljubljana, I can order a book using Volt, which is the food distribution company. And when I tested them, to my surprise, it, it took 18 minutes from order to delivery to my to my door. If somebody 10 years ago would say to me that I would be ordering uh, books with a, with a telephone application and the delivery time uh, will be 18 minutes, I would consider this as a kind of a fan, uh, of a science fiction. And of course, we have electronic books which we can access in a second wherever we are from wherever th those books are stored if we have 
uh, uh, the devices and credit cards or hacking abilities which allow us to 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 to, to access these books um, another huge change is that competition of other media exploded uh, when i was uh, young and beautiful we had two we had two tv channels in my home now i have around 600 tv channels with a lot of su subscription uh, services with video libraries like hbo like uh, netflix like amazon prime like apple tv and all these media are shipping to my home enormous amounts of video content for enormously low prices if i want music i can use spotify if i want to socialize i can use of course facebook twitter TikTok, whatever so the amount of media content which is offered to us these days is just enormous and all this thanks to a smartphone which is at least from my point of view one of the most important inventions in in last 20 50 years why because it squeezed all traditional media tv tvs radios writing machines uh, letters phones faxes computers and so on and so forth into one single small machine which safely sits in my pocket and which allows me to communicate with my cousin in bolivia with my aunt in italy it allows me to shop from 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 chinese uh, uh, merchandisers it allows me to read books it allows me to watch movies it, it allows me to 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 listen uh, to the to the music in short it allows me to use all the media content for which i once upon the time used a huge sets of media or have to physically move to cinema to theater to the concert which i know uh, now don't have to do especially now of course when we are all uh, uh, landed down by the by the pandemics so to make the long story short, uh, in US, uh, 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 we don't have such data for Europe, but we assume that they are pretty much similar. Uh, an adult sp spent uh, seven hours and 50 minutes per day consuming digital media in 2020. That's huge. That's enormous. That's a lot. And I would also say that's a little bit too much and this of course all these developments raise a big important question to all of us who are involved in book business namely how to make books visible and sellable in the time where we are attacked from all sides with free content and in uh, in, in media circumstances in which uh, information is abundant we have too much information and we have too much free information and this, in this kind of environment persuading customers to pay for information to pay for content in book format is i think one of the toughest tasks which we have in publishing and which is as a consequence making marketing one of the main publishing skills and of course uh, saving peace of mind in such a competitive environment requires a special uh, abilities so if we su sum up what changed in book business there are things which are the same as they were as they were uh, 50 years ago one of the main jobs of the publishers is to pick up the right title package it edit it and send it to the market and at the same time making as visible as and accessible in as many retail places as possible this is the primary publishing skill from 20th and 19th and 18th century and these publishing skills are still needed to survive in publishing world but a set of new challenges took place if we want to survive in today's media environment as publishers we need to understand the confluence of formats and sales channels we need to know how to optimize search engine search we need to opti we need to know how to innovate in this new media in environment 
uh, in this new screen media environment and we need to know how to distribute books in this new uh, environment, both in physical and both in, in digital content. There is a whole new environment uh, popping out around, around authors. They are becoming brands more than they ever were. And what publishers need to know is how to help authors in this enterprise. And at the same time, they need to understand that authors need them much less than they needed them 50 years ago because of the easiness of self-publishing. So one of the biggest challenges, I assume, in the world of publishing is how to find a new equilibrium between authors and publishers. And last but not least, we need to understand, and this is more a cultural task than a publishing publisher's task, this is more a task of educators, of administrators, of intellectuals, of others, authors. We need to understand and we, we need to persuade the public why long form re reading content still matters in the, in the times of new glitzy media. And this, of course, re re require a separate and special and quite long discussion. But I want to focus in the challenge number two, namely in this, if we want to survive as publishers in this new uh, uh, media uh, uh, environment, we need to be a little bit similar to my hero from my youth, Getafix, who's, who was making magic potion in little Gaelic village. And we need to know, to, to have this magic, this new magic potion, of course, needs to be a kind of new business models. There is no quick fixes in this, I believe, but there are fixes which can, uh, which run on the on the on the which are successful on the long run. If we sum up what, what we looked at, is that um, there is a set of appearances and new models which are appearing in the market. There is self-publishing in, in print and digital, which is becoming huge and very important. And this self-publishing is taking place in print format. We will discuss this tomorrow with uh, two successful authors who do self-publishing in print. There is self-publishing in E, which is the easiest and which is the most present in, in, in uh, uh, big world markets, and there is self-publishing in audio in the format of different podcasts and uh, fiction stories. Um, a new model which will be discussed today is subscription for audio and ebooks, and uh, uh, new uh, as a part of this subscription model, new content started to be developed in in in. in, in especially in audio. We have book series, which are, as a matter of fact, not book series, but are dra drama series or episodes like in, in TV. And we have a lot of fiction podcasts. And in all this, what needs to be done is building authorial brands across languages and media platforms. In some highly developed market, these uh, uh, procedures are taking place and going on. But the question which needs to be answered, especially in our environment, and that's something what we will at least partially tr try to do uh, today, is can these business models be applied to the book markets with small turnovers like Croatian, Slovenian, Lithuanian, and so on? I think this is a big question which needs a lot of thinking, a lot of consideration, a lot of experimentation, a lot of ex and a lot of experimentation. And uh, to be honest, the future is really different. Because if we look at Swedish numbers, uh, Sweden is very interesting case story because in 2020s, Sw Swedish book market grow eight point percent in sales and 21.5% in volume, which means that, of course, the turnover in Swedish ma market was higher for 8%. But in order to achieve this 
uh, higher turnover, Swedish publishers had to sell 20% more books. What simply put means they had to work more for less. And this is one of those more for less situations which I don't like very much. As a consequence, average book price fell for about 10%. And the entire landscape started to change because publishers' revenues from physical bookstores fell from 21 to 13%. And on the other hand, their revenues from digital subscription grew up from 24 to 57%. They almost doubled. Simply put, the entire landscape turned from physical to digital. And most of this change took place thanks to, thanks to audio. So we have here a really important change, which requires more products for less money. And in order to survive in this kind of environment, of course, a set of new skills are necessary. And in addition, of course, uh, 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 costs need to be, some costs need to be lowered, some costs need to, 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 to be hired, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is becoming extremely complicated issue. And I assume this is one of the futures which is in front of us. But future telling is something what is not very uh, stable and what is uh, recommended to be done predominant, predominantly by old gypsy ladies, not by uh, old white men as I am. So I would not, I, I would skip uh, fortune telling, but I would nevertheless fortune tell one thing. And this is that this old fashioned traditional publishing model, which we have on the screen, and which was stable and there for 300 years, uh, which worked in a way that author uh, contacted publisher or the, the, the other way around. Publisher used printer to, pr to print the books. Then they ship, the publisher shipped with shippers the book to booksellers. And the booksellers sold the books to readers or to libraries or to book clubs or whatever. And then authors. Bo uh, uh, got uh, uh, feedback information about the impact of the, their books through the sales number. This good old-fashioned publishing model, which was stable for 300 uh, uh, years, is more or less gone for good. And at this point, I leave the podium to Rüdiger with, to continue with more contemporary things. Okay, Rudiger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, Micha. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I will, in a way, um, try to follow up exactly where Miha left us. But in the first moment, I will not jump into the present right away, but go back to the to a very, very long past for a very quick session. Um, I, I will try to give you some orientation based on some numbers uh, with a fairly significant focus on why the last year, the pandemic year of 2020, has been so relevant for us uh, and um, show what has been accelerated uh, in that pandemic uh, year. Uh, for a start, two quotes from uh, similar debates that we had organized last fall um, with a bunch of people from the industry, from very different countries, um, trying to assess where do we stand after half a year of pandemic. But the main lessons are still valid. One was a small publisher from Mexico who had really struggled very, very actively to reinvent his business, publishing and distribution uh, from scratch 
a going digital building community, serving this community as if he would be, I don't know, a social activist rather than a publisher. And at the end, he said, well, the, uh, the future seems to be very good for those who survive. And that second half, of course, is the caveat for those who survive is uh, saying not everybody will be in that position. And the second was a lawyer specialized uh, in Germany in, uh, in bankruptcy filings. And he had, uh, out of his experience, a very important message and that was restructure your business and not your debt, meaning do not go all the way to the trap of bankruptcy, of uh, falling into deep uh, financial trouble. Uh, start acting much earlier by doing the restructuring of your business. Um, this is how we, I have, a, uh, I have one quick question. Uh, could you please, at the stage in, in um, Zankarev Dom, uh, mute your microphone because there is a lot of background noise and that's a little bit um, complicated. Thank you so much. Uh, this is how we look at reading uh, for the last 600 years. On the right hand side, we see a fabulous pa uh, graffiti painting <coughs> uh, in Florence by Fra Angelico. When you look at the monk, uh, at the monk uh, on the right side, he is a hundred years before Gutenberg, already immersed in a book in exactly the same posture as on the left-hand side, that lady uh, whose picture I took in India a few years ago, who is reading in a Kindle. And I show you this to remind you that our conception, how reading, and particularly um, uh, immersive reading works, uh, has not changed over six centuries. On the one hand, that is correct, because uh, all these very specific brain uh, functionalities that are activated uh, through uh, deep reading, uh, they are not changing. But the context, uh, how we read, where we read, how we behave with regard to books, authors, texts, uh, etc., and the consumption of these texts, that has dramatically changed. And again, to a big degree, smartphones and all that connectivity have uh, been the drivers in that. We see that today, uh, on the right-hand side, the picture is of a book fair in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. On the lower left, you see a fan fiction audience in New York a few years ago <clears throat> at a book con uh, event. You see that books and reading has become much more of a communication process, of an exchange, and that makes a big impact and requires, as Micha mentioned already before in his talk, a lot of adjusting, a lot of digital transformation. But um, when we uh, look at who is really designing and driving that transformation of the business, very, very often that was a, a meme circulated uh, also last year at some point. Um, um, people were making jokes about uh, so many years have passed in most companies and no one in the management had really organized that digital transformation until the advent of the virus, COVID-19. And so it came to the question, who led the digital transformation of your company really? Was it the CEO? Was it the chief technology officer? Or was it the stupid virus? And that virus accelerated uh, the change dramatically and in very real terms. You see on that chart uh, uh, how uh, online in and e-commerce uh, in uh, American retail sales have been continuously but slowly growing for the past two decades. But then between 2019 and the last quarter of 2020, suddenly there was a jump. And that was 
um, uh, triggered by the virus because everybody was uh, under lockdown had uh, to shift most of the media consumption, most of the uh, even grocery shopping um, from going to a store to uh, doing a few clicks on your smartphone or your laptop. And that is not going away anymore. There is a very high certainty and there are quite a few changes that are here to stay. We did uh, with a data uh, of a digital distributor in Germany, uh, a really hard data-based uh, study on, on <coughs> audiobook consumption in Germany, Austria, and the German language part of Switzerland last year. And we saw, uh, that is the red line here, when the lockdown, the first lockdown uh, started in March, um, it was obvious uh, and, and, and unsurprising that you had a huge peak of download sales where people were buying online audiobooks for themselves and for their kids uh, to entertain uh, them, uh, to, uh, to, to also buy learning material, learning support material. But that peak was very short lived. It is true that after the after the end of the lockdown and even more after uh, by the end of last year, the overall level of these audio and ebook consumption levels have been increasing quite significantly, but not so much as is the case with a totally different model, and that's the green line, and that reflects subscription. Now, for years and years. Everybody in the trade, regardless where, told me uh, subscriptions, they don't work for books. They may work for movies, for music, but not for books. And then there came some reasons. And guess what? Uh, the big change in the pandemic. And in the meantime, I have the, these numbers, not only for the first few months of last year's, um, but for the full year and for early 20, uh, 2021, I see that that green line of audiobook and also a partly ebook subscription is increasing in a very continuous way, way and uh, doing so in very different markets. That's not just the specific of, let's say, Sweden or Germany. We can see that in Brazil, and I'm sure in one way or another, to the degree that um, uh, subscription is available, like for those people who are reading in English and subscribe to Amazon, that will be not so different in a place uh, like, um, like Slovenia. Uh, the other thing is that um, the, the, the impact of the pandemic on, for instance, publishing companies is not the same for everyone, but shows very significant differences. If you look at um, very successful big corporate publishing companies internationally, such as Penguin Random House or HarperCollins, they had fairly good years. Some even had very, very positive years. Bloomsbury, the publisher of Harry Potter, or uh, Achette in France, which, uh, uh, which has also a big operation in Great Britain and in the US, they saw really vibrant years driven always by strong digital revenue. But on the other hand, you also saw some who could not uh, cope so well with the entire transformation. They had also very sig significant increases in ebooks, in digital audio, like Simon and Schuster. Uh, but um, the, the, the whole value chain, the, the ways how they organize their business, was far not so robust as with Penguin Random House and HarperCollins. At the end of the day, uh, that turned out, uh, that resulted in very uh, much more difficult um, financial results. And now we see a new wave of industry consolidation where the successful houses 
by the less successful houses like Penguin Random House now acquiring Simon and Schuster and Harper Collins acquiring Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, a publisher that lost spe specifically strongly because they are very active in education and they couldn't adjust uh, to digital education. So suddenly you see really a gap opening between winners and losers. And I'm sure that that consolidation where the more, um, the, the better, the, the stronger houses will acquire the less strong will not be limited to the Anglo-Saxon market, but uh, it will have similar impacts all over the place, including Europe and including both the large markets and the small markets. At some point, I tried to make sense of all of these dynamics and came up with a fairly um, <clears throat> simple um, matrix um, trying to summarize what are the questions uh, brought to us by the pandemic. And the first thing is COVID-19 or the corona pandemic is not about anything in particular. It's really paramount. It, it, it hits everyone from health to politics, from econom uh, economies, uh, to emotional strains. It is uh, um, a unifying force in so far as it is hit hitting everyone and everything equally, but not in the same strength. You have huge differences between, for instance, affluent people versus poor people, old versus young. Uh, big countries or vibrant cities are in a better position than small places with little weak infrastructures. And we see right now on a global level how hard it is about to hit fragile societies. Uh, that means uh, COVID is a primary condition, which is really on the very ways how we live and interact. And you cannot think that one at one point it will be over and we will go back to the old ways. That's certainly not what's going to happen. Instead, it is a very strong accelerating force for transformations. And these uh, transformations are not new. They have not been caused by the pandemic, but it was um, transformations already in the place which become much stronger. And I want to show you uh, a few examples uh, that show you that uh, the, the, also on the, on the example of publishing markets, uh, we are not on a level playing field, but different, um, different um, places, different markets, different parts of the industry are concerned by uh, in very different ways. A few weeks ago, I came across an article in the French publishing trade magazine Libre Hebdo, uh, where they celebrated what you see on the right hand side of that chart, that spectacular upsurge in March of sales numbers from a very, very weak position because France was hit very strongly. And uh, the article said, wow, what, what a wonderful um, situation. We have spectacular growth again. Well, I was a little bit worried and, 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 and confused by that because I thought, wait a moment, uh, if there is some growth for one week, uh, for one month, uh, that's not good enough, strong enough to compensate for all the loss that um, I was going uh, on for the last few years in the French book, book market. And so I, uh, I checked the numbers uh, from January 2018 all the way through early 2021. So a little bit more than two years. And that is the graphic that uh, you see here. And in the long term, when you look into the detail and uh, on the long term realities, you see, well, of course, there was a drop with the lockdowns, which is where the lines went down. And then it was a, a, a research, but it is not the celebrated resilience of the book market, uh, which could compensate for the loss very quickly. No, it was just in the long term, a continuation 
of a downward trend that we saw already over the years and the years in France. Uh, Germany, by comparison, has the reputation of being perhaps the most boring because the most robust book market in all of Europe. <clears throat> and we see, indeed, here that, that is a, uh, a snapshot of, uh, of um, the print sales of books in Germany in all of uh, 2020 as compared to 2019, month by month by month. And you see in the green lines that indeed when there was a lockdown in March, April, and then again in December, <clears throat> um, it, uh, it was going down, uh, no surprise. But um, again, in the long run, if you look uh, up these numbers over a decade, you see the, the overall decline, the loss in 2020 was a tiny little bit stronger than in the previous years, but it was very consistent with, with a 10 year long um, declining uh, fundamental trend. And <clears throat> so we must be aware that we are not in a thriving industry where we can expect growth um, very quickly. Uh, I was diving more deeply into that by comparison, uh, by, uh, by doing various comparisons on the sales data of all print books in Germany over a decade. And I did this with my colleague, um, Michaela Fleischacker, whom, uh, who will be with us in the conversation in the second round uh, today. And uh, what you can see is that in most of the in most of the parts of the trade, um, the both the, the stable months and the declining months were the same with little iterations. Uh, in most years, we see very fundamental trends like a declining uh, Christmas sales over 10 years. And um, the decline of the, uh, triggered by the pandemic was just a little bit stronger than what you would have expected even without the pandemic. What are the drivers? One of the drivers is, as Miha mentioned already, of course, a change in, uh, <clears throat> in, in, in consumption habits. We see that millennial, even book lovers, um, have an enormous preference for doing things first online on their mob mobile gadgets traditional readers are much less inclined to do so. But if you look overall um, at, at, uh, at uh, how much time people spend in various mobile um, digital devices, you see a very similar uh, con and continuous um, increase, both for traditional readers and for the million, millennial book lovers. They are a little bit, uh, uh, um, they were a few years ago where the traditional readers are uh, today, but at the end of the day, it's the same long-term tendency. And we see that that is a tendency that uh, will open the gates. I showed you that uh, already in the beginning, that will open the gates for new models, even if everybody thought at, uh, for a long time that these trends like subscription would not apply successfully to the book, book world. And of course, selling books in subscriptions is an entirely different thing. Uh, on the upside, it's nothing new. We had subscriptions in the 19th century. The uh, literature of the 19th century was basically driven by subscriptions. We had book clubs until the 1960s, 70s, all over, the, uh, all over Europe. But a return means a totally different relationship. And you have a community of uh, subscribing users that you can reach more easily. But it is also showing you that there is a wall, an invisible wall, um, making the difference between those who you have as subscribers and all the rest. Um, and it is very much more difficult to reach new consumers outside of that group of your subscribers 
who are, uh, are buying your books and reading your books already. A second thing is that we observe on multiple levels and also not only since last year, uh, an increase of the backlist. Yeah, we see, um, we see that um, the, um, uh, we, we see that the front list titles, the, the top sellers are going down and the backlist is gaining in importance. And that is particularly odd because on the one hand, it would be a big opportunity to make economically sense of all those books that you have already in your, in your storage. Uh, but all the marketing uh, euros in publishing companies and also in uh, retail are usually spent on the front list. So suddenly we discover that probably much of that money is spent on the wrong titles. We should focus more on the backlist. And what I showed here at first for digital books at uh, the example of uh, Kobo, the ebook. Um, um, service by, uh, from, from Rakuten, which is fairly significant in a number of European countries like uh, Germany or uh, the Netherlands. The same trends uh, can now more recently be seen in printed uh, book sales. And here I was looking not at the money made of the books, but how, uh, I was looking at how many units, how many copies have been purchased uh, by, uh, by consumers in Germany over the past five years. And you see again, the number of backlist is clearly and continuously increasing and front list is going down. So that leads me to where also Mia has ended to re-emphasize that deep shift in the structure of our industry, how it works, and uh, how it is uh, getting more complex. Uh, that is uh, in a very simple way, the old, the traditional model where you have the publishers producing, uh, regardless of their size, books, which are traveling through a few, not so too many distribution channels and are picked up by consumers to be bought and then uh, perhaps read. And then, um, 10 years ago, self-publishing came to the equation and uh, added, the, but it was at the beginning, the same thing. Today, that is uh, the much more complex picture is uh, that we have an increasing number of, of, of ways of um, consuming, discovering, living with content, being in networks, communicating with my friends and with uh, people that I, I don't even know uh, with social media on what I watch, what I read, where I learn, how I do entertain myself. And um, becoming visible is much more of a channel, uh, of a channel, a challenge. And that means that books are increasingly uh, considered as something exquisite, designed for a small elite and not that basic um, um, cultural food that most of us um, uh, understand, uh, understood books to be for such a long time. This means also, um, uh, this means also that, um, uh, that, um, the, the forms, how books are consumed dig, uh, digitally are changing. And uh, it's not one title at a time, but we are speaking of platforms, of ecosystems, of new business and distribution models. The format, uh, if this is print or digital, audio or ebook, is becoming less and less relevant. And uh, the ways how uh, pe uh, people write and bring perhaps even directly their, uh, their, their books, their works to the customers uh, are a direct competition to all the traditional publishers. 
what we learn, what do we learn out of this? Number one, books have ceased to have one clear format uh, that everyone for any given type of content and purpose uses in similar ways. That is just not the case anymore. We need to open our minds and be aware that uh, digital books are increasingly morphing into a continuous stream like the movies on Netflix uh, and uh, the consumption uh, happens in more and more fluid, flexible, instant, uh, in, uh, instant driven ways. And um, it is not good enough to uh, pay attention, for instance, to ebooks. We must really start to understand that there is an, a universe, uh, uh, an ecosystem uh, of digital consumer books in many forms. And some examples of these many forms are the case studies that we will bring to you after the break. I overran, I guess, a little bit, but uh, we are fairly in, within our time. And Thank I you. hand over to the moderation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radiger. I, uh, let, me, let me keep yeah. that slide for a few instants in case that you want to copy one of these sources. Excellent. Um, Let's leave you. it. Um, Rediger, uh, we have a question uh, that I actually think it's aimed uh, for you, but Micha can also answer it. Uh, Alinka Schauperl is asking, um, do you know how publishers of scientific literature went through the pandemics? Um, did they suffer any change? Did they have to adapt since they have moved to di digital already several years ago? Uh, I, I don't uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm trying, did I lose you? Um, do you want no. me to repeat? No, the no, question? no, 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 uh, no. Okay. You just, are here. Uh, yeah, you can I'm, see I'm you. still here. That's good. Okay. Um, I don't, uh, I just didn't have the time to really do my numbers. I will do this in the next few months. I would assume that, uh, the big, um, uh, academic presses should have had a fairly good year because they switch to digital, digital uh, first, to subscription models, to all these uh, different direct sales, uh, direct sales models to libraries. Um, they, they switched to this um, 10 years ago, eight years ago. So I guess for many of them, it should not have had the same impact what I know is uh, most of the educational publishing houses, they had a very hard time uh, because most of them were not prepared for digital. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Micha, if you would like to add something, please do. But I also have another question for you. Well, if for a tiny moment you can think of me as of um, typical Slovenian publisher, um, I would like to know how well do I move between all these new pillars and challenges ahead of me? How well do I understand the skills, the new skills that I'm supposed to have? Um, is my mind opened if I use Rediger's words? Well, I mean, you can be quite frank. It, I can it, take it. It depends who you are. <laughs> I mean. Uh, and in the end of the day, as long as publishing business is uh, a business, then your numbers tell you how successful you are. If you are in red, you are okay. If you are in black, you are not okay. That's mm -hmm. that's that's uh, quite, quite quite simple. And what even more matters today, I think, uh, are the day is also the issue, the numbers which show how big your turnover is because. If you are okay and in, in, in black, but your turnover is shrinking on the long run, you are not okay. So that's that, that, that's very simple, simple measurements. And regarding Slovenian publishers, I would say that some are very innovative, uh, and but some are not. And uh, the next few years, I think, will quite change the Slovenian publishing landscape in a way that some of them might disappear even some big ones might disappear and some small ones will become big ones that change which we saw in swedish market which showed very clear turn uh, turn from 
uh, classical retailing to, 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 to digital content quite clearly indicates the change in power in publishing world. Uh, and this shows also in, in, in the fact that Storytel, which is the biggest Swedish uh, audio content company which operates globally, and which is four times bigger in terms of turnover than entire Slovenian publishing, but it's still quite small in, 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 in global publishing, that Storytel bought the second biggest Swedish publishing house, what would be impossible 10 years ago, because 10 years ago there was no Storytel. <laughs> so things are, are changing quite fast, and I assume that these changes will happen also in, in our market in next mm -hmm. years. Can okay, I, thank can you I so ask uh, one Redinger, thought? Please. Um, yeah. I would um, follow up on Miha and say uh, it's not it's not by far good enough to know if you are in black or in red. Uh, you must learn to identify and read continuously many more numbers, many more indicators that show where you are or where you are missing something. For instance, you should um, really have a very clear eye on what do I sell more, backlist or frontlist? How do I sell this? Which are the channels that, um, uh, that are selling most of my books? And are they in sync with my marketing efforts? Or do I spend my money on marketing, which doesn't result in sales, and uh, I happen to have good sales because I have just one bestseller, but basically I have no control and I have no idea what, what makes the difference between me and the market. And the next thing is, where can I find information about the end consumer? Because in a market like Croatia or Slovenia, that is not so simple because you don't have these Nielsen type of day-to-day uh, -day accurate statistics. How can I see uh, what my consumers, who are my consumers? Because the, uh, the, the market is more and more segmented. So it will require an increasing amount of ingenuity, but also of work to always update my observation of the market. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this valuable advice, Redinger. Okay, let's wrap it out now. Seriously, we have 10 minutes coffee break. So shall we question, meet, let's may. say, 10 past 11, and we might have to shorten a little bit the following debate, but we should do okay. Um, so see you 10 past 10. Uh, Micha Redinger and Michaela is also getting ready. Okay, see you in a while. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your coffee. Everyone attending this event, kindly remember this is also an opportunity to ask questions, ask for a clarification or comment on what you will hear. And I will remain a guardian of the chat box, of course. And now we go back to Vienna, where Rediger and Michaela will do presentation of examples of good practices. So, Rediger, please take over. Thank you. Um, what we have in our secret little box is a bunch of um, concrete case studies. Um, from very, very different organizations and in very different media systems, ecosystems. Uh, so it's going to be a wild ride. Uh, and I want to start with uh, someone who seems to be as far away from the re reality of small Central European markets as could be thought possible. Um, and I show you that person, Jesus Badenes, uh, who, because you will recognize that he, the experiences from what the last year brought to his organization, Planeta, is not so different from what you uh, might have experienced. And that's a very important factor to see 
that small can learn from big and vice versa. Um, Jesus Padenes is uh, the CEO of Planeta for 10 years or so. And Planeta is the largest uh, publishing co uh, corporation in the Spanish language. They're based in Barcelona and they only they not, they not only dominate the Spanish market, but also large portions of the Latin American market. And the turnover of a Planeta right now is around 800 million euros. So huge by any standards that you are used to. And yet the market, even that huge Spanish language market, Spanish is one of the very, very large uh, languages as we know. Even that huge Spanish language market, in fact, is not one market, but more and more segmented. Even in Spain, you don't have the Spanish market. You have a Catalan market, which is fairly different from what's going on in Madrid or in the Basque country, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Planeta, despite its size, has been at the forefront of experimentation for many years because um, Spain and the Spanish book market was hit by the last crisis, the economic crisis of 2008, particular, uh, particularly strongly. Uh, the market uh, came down in turnover in Spain by around 30% uh, between 2010-11 uh, and 2015. So really dramatic. And that was triggering their clear understanding we must venture into new ways, into new tricks, time and again, not once, not twice, but as a continuous proce process. And so I uh, asked uh, Dejan of the uh, IT staff now to start that first video with Jesus Padenes, where he explains how they lived the past year. First of all, uh, I have to say that the pandemic really struck us uh, one year ago, I mean, in March uh, 2020, was really the most difficult time in our lives. I mean, we thought that the market was going to disappear. We were starting a confinement. We were we had a lockdown uh, three months long. Uh, we were, of course, uh, basically trying to see to foresee the impact of the of the of that in sales, um, and really, and we had to develop uh, skills as well. But Happily enough, I mean, the, 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 the situation has turned out being very good for the Spanish publishers. I mean, Spain has been a good market in 2020, and it's even better in 2021. It is true that during the pandemic, uh, we suffered a lot, but it's not less true that from uh, the second half of June until today, the market has been, has been growing uh, enormously. I mean, just an example, from January 1st, uh, 2021, Today, the market has grown 24%. Last year, even considering the lockdown, the market grew 3%. So basically, it has been very good numbers for us, for market terms. And yet, it's true what you are saying that the, the job, our job has changed a lot. And it's still true that the physical books are very important because you said something which is, which I, of course, I agree, which is that the digital has taken a like a really big toll, I mean, has grown a lot, but has been, I mean, the, the revolution once again has been e-commerce, basically has been selling uh, physical books through digital platforms. That has been what has accounted for most of the impact last year. It's also true that digital books, uh, both in subscription and a la carte, ha have grown, but if I had to say, to share with you our, our breakdown, the breakdown down of our revenues last year, 94% came from physical, only 6% came from digital. Yet it's true that this, out of this 94% that it's, uh, it's physical, 30% uh, were e-commerce. So basically what is true is that uh, the e-commerce has grown a lot and it's still showing uh, a lot of power this year. We also are seeing another impact, which is very, I think it's very interesting, which is that Spaniards like to buy books from vicinity. So basically, uh, buying books close to home uh, has been also a tendency this year. This is very good for independent 
bookstores. Independent bookstores are not having a good uh, year because uh, people uh, like to avoid uh, big uh, centers of the city or big malls and they go to uh, basically to proximity stores. And that has been very wrong. For our skill set, yes, we, we are adapting uh, every year and now even more rapidly than before, but we feel that we are doing well. I mean, probably one of the functions that is uh, having to adapt more rapidly is marketing. We mentioned it before, and social networks for us are very important. We are not uh, carrying out presentations, physical presentations like before, but still we have to find to find our readers. And we are we are finding our readers uh, basically through, through new marketing uh, skills and, and digital. And yes, and metadata is still important. We I think we are doing a good job on that. And we are, for example, we just uh, last week we started we, we launched a new book by Maria Duenas, who is a, a bestseller in Spain. And we will have a data which will be probably around thirty thousand books in the first week. Which for us is a very very good number. I mean, like comparing with some other markets, it's like selling I don't know, like in England maybe one hundred thousand copies, a month or three hundred thousand copies in two months. So. We are seeing a solid market. Of course, we are seeing also the need to change and to develop new skills, most of them digital, but still we have the luck of uh, having the time of doing it little by little. It's mm -hmm. much easier to adapt yourself in a market that is growing than to do it in a market which is depleting. So we are, we are, well, we are, we are not taking more time, but basically we think that we are now doing our job in a market which allows it uh, with some patience. So, if I recap very quickly, uh, you see even that huge company operates in a big language in a market that is predominantly physical. But even here, last year uh, saw a major shift to e-commerce, meaning to uh, selling, uh, to ordering books and delivering books on the internet. Uh, at the same time, Jesus said, um, the small book sh uh, shops had a renaissance because the local relationships between the people at the small shops and their, their, their communities are so much closer so that they are less affected by the pandemic, even uh, if it's in a big city. Uh, in all the markets that we could observe, the worst was the second largest book um, uh, selling chains operating in huge supermarkets or, or shopping centers. They were hit the worst. They had the hardest time. Those who were either at the top of the food chain or those who were very localized, they had much more options uh, to operate. Now, the other thing is, um, um, when we go beyond that, uh, that first example, is that uh, I, uh, both Mia and myself showed uh, this in our slides in the first session in the morning, we operate with books less and less in that exclusive uh, way that books are seen as something, something uh, specific, special. Uh, outstanding, different from everything else. It is much more an integrated, segmented, but still integrated universe where you see all kinds of media formats coming together for storytelling. And with uh, the, the advent of Netflix and all these serializing TV shows, uh, the ecosystems of storytelling, of narratives, has dramatically changed. Uh, I will show you a little slide to illustrate what I mean. Wait a moment. Uh, so here we go. We see that books need to find their place in the minds, in the time, in the attention span of the readers. Uh, between all these other things. And when things are working out well, uh, it, the result be, uh, can be miraculous. Um, one of our favorite case study 
is about Elena Ferrante. I'm sure that most of you will have heard of Elena Ferrante, uh, which is a pseudonym for a writer, probably a woman, uh, working in Napoli, in Italy, and who has um, started, uh, not uh, her, her writing career, he, she, she, she wrote novels that have been published, even translated 10 years ago already, but to not very big success. And then uh, a, a series of four volumes with um, kind of characteristics of a memoir about uh, women friendships and two uh, life stories of two women uh, that were intertwined over a long period of time uh, became a roaring success against all the odds of how that came into the marketplace. Um, the books uh, of uh, Elena Ferrante were not published by one of the large corporate houses like Mondadori in Italy, but uh, uh, by a tiny publisher called AO edi um, um, Edizioni AO. Edizioni AO uh, nevertheless uh, succeeded in marketing to make that a phenomenon in Italy from the very start. But more importantly, um, it was uh, 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 Edizioni AO has a sister company sitting in the US, Europa Editions, and Europa Editions uh, turned, picked up that title and understood very quickly that it was perfect for a similar audience in the United States. But of course, uh, that relevant, um, that respective audience in the US was not only much, much bigger, it suddenly uh, jumped across all the borders, all the restrictions, because by having such a big success in the American market, it was picked up everywhere uh, in Europe and uh, in Germany, in, uh, for instance, uh, it was published by Surkamp, which traditionally is the very highbrow literary brand in Germany, which only over the past few years had started to get more into the field of quality fiction with a best-selling potential. And then it was picked up for, uh, for a movie adaptation by uh, by uh, HBO, one of the big um, uh, channels uh, of uh, serial TV in the US. And uh, what we uh, try to understand here in that chart was how, um, how did the German publisher handle um, the, the Ferrante books in order to make the most of it? And that is uh, a success story in itself, uh, because as you see, the, 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 the curve of sales from July 2016, when the first volume was released in German translation, until today is continuing and sustaining such a, uh, such a success story over such a long period of time uh, is not very, uh, very easy because uh, you need to have a very clear eye how to reiterate the same brand. You have a very strong author brand with Elena Ferrante, but um, they try, Surkamp try it, the, the, the normal reaction would have been to shoot out the first volume after six months to follow up with the paperback edition to sell a few more copies and only then come up with the second um, volume, etc., etc. They did that differently and said, no, we hold back the paperback and we do a high priced uh, strategy where we insist that Elena Ferrante as a high brand author with a rather urban, suburban, well-educated, affluent female audience has the potential of keeping that momentum even in the high priced um, um, hardcover edition. And then they continued that and came 
out with uh, the, uh, the the trade paperbacks only when uh, the the TV adaptation was aired. And another surprise was that uh, the HBO series was not aired by one of the big uh, German um, um, traditional um, uh, public uh, tra uh, TV stations, uh, but by Magenta. Magenta is German telecom, and they launched uh, a very innovative way of, pro uh, produce, uh, of, of buying rights to premium shows for their uh, mobile phone um, TV program. And they bought the rights of Elena Ferrante. And um, we saw that most in German publishing ignored that even these, these uh, telecom mobile phone driven things had reached uh, a wide audience that could compare to the traditional uh, TV shows. And so that worked um, uh, even through that very innovative um, um, uh, channel. And at the end of the day, to wrap it up, you can see that Suakam managed to do a very bold mix of very conservative, meaning hardcover driven, high priced strategy uh, combined with innovative approaches uh, that is a very consistent marketing. Uh, they were having a very clear eye about who was their audience and said they would rather be prepared to go for the, uh, for the, the, the hardback, the hardcover edition. And <clears throat> they could even then uh, convince these audiences together with Telecom uh, to follow the series even when it was uh, not aired in traditional TV. Uh, we saw similar examples in Germany, where uh, publishing companies even totally ignored this. And at the end of the day, even with very, very strong branded authors who had a reading community of their own in Germany. Uh, and uh, when they didn't follow such a key strategy, the, the, the extra sales that they could realize were very, very small by comparison to what Surkamp succeeded with their very clear eye on what they had and where they, um, where they, uh, how they operated to reach their audience. Now I hand over to Michaela, who goes one step further from those still fairly traditional things, publishing with books and having a TV series to totally different platforms. Uh, Michaela. Thank you, Rüdiger. Uh, yeah, one way um, we observed in the recent years, of course, uh, to engage with communities and uh, establish cross-media um, marketing on another level is, of course, by using Instagram. A lot of people know this app all over the world and use it on a daily basis. One million active users have been there uh, in January 2020. And uh, regarding to books and book lovers, they are coming together uh, by using or uh, by um, uh, finding their uh, community under the hashtag Bookstagram, which uh, was used by uh, more than 61 million, uh, which was used more than 61 million times up until yesterday. Uh, as we see on the right hand side, uh, of course, it's all eating with your eyes first. Book uh, pictures are important. Book lovers and book uh, and publishers need uh, interior design and aesthetics. And it's all a matter of copy, collect, and uh, display your own libraries. Uh, some even taking it to uh, another level, like uh, in the middle on the right hand side, a guy from Romania who's uh, started out um, giving cues on how to decorate uh, your bookshelf. And now he's in a um, paid membership with Cornelsen, a German educational publisher, and recreating. Um, logos and movie posters uh, by arranging his bookshelf on the floor. Uh, and of course, an, uh, a lot of authors, publishers um, engage through this pub, uh, platform with customers, fans, and uh, their communities. And 
uh, even by just simple posting like uh, Javier Castillo, uh, a number one bestseller pub, uh, author from Spain, uh, uh, posting just uh, himself signing his books to create a more intimate and uh, personal um, engagement with his fans and his community. But uh, another trend which has recently came up and is highly underestimated by a lot of publishers and not used by a lot of booksellers is uh, TikTok. Um, the video social media sharing uh, network uh, is, of course, was broadly discussed and is uh, also uh, broadly discussed right now because of its privacy policies. But um, you have to keep in mind that it was the fastest growing entertainment app in 2020 with more than 69 million down, uh, 690 million downloads. And uh, it's the unruly play, mainly the unruly playground of the generation set, but they are the customers of now and the customers of tomorrow. And they are getting served uh, videos and bits and pieces um, recommend uh, they are recommending them uh, under themselves books and uh, I think that uh, publishers and uh, authors ha have to pick on that trend and have to um, invest time to get to know their future audience by um, just looking into it a little bit more and I want to show you a compilation of a selection of videos um, regarding what's going on there under the uh, hashtag book talk. At first, uh, we will see a video um, of the ideal customer everyone wants to achieve. Uh, then two uh, videos about uh, bookstores who established themselves as travel sites and uh, followed by recommendation videos one by a user and one by a, a small a bookseller in somewhere in, in, in uh, the US. And uh, also what's going on there about challenges where uh, users present a selection of their own books in, and their own library on certain topics. So could you please see the video now? I'd show you how many books I've read this year versus how many I've bought. It's embarrassing. Look at that tower. Forget about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I have the Leaning Tower of Paper. I think I have a problem. Who allowed me to have money? Still going. Oh my. I blame BookTok for all of this. So thanks guys, now I'm broke. used bookstore with me? This is Pickwick Bookshop in Nyack, New York. It's a book lover's paradise, stocked floor to ceiling with every genre. Most books are used, but they have some new ones too. You ever read a nonfiction book that you learned so much from that it changed the way you think about everything? And from that point on, there was the time before you read that book and the time after you read that book? Here's three books that, if you have not read them yet, might do that for you. First one, Sapiens, A History of All of Humankind. You gotta read it. Next one, Ishmael, Socratic Conversation with the Gorilla. And the third one is Thinking in Systems. This will literally make you think that you can solve every single problem that you've ever encountered. What nonfiction books have changed the way that you think about the world? Books that I think will be classics in a few years, or at least taught in schools for sure. And shout out to Brie and Zoran because this idea is perfect. An American Marriage. This book 
it delivers on so many fronts and will have you asking so many questions and yeah it's yeah classic Addie LaRue for the simple fact of I want to see an AP literature question about how Addie's journey would have been different if she was black or a person of color period like there's so much that you can dissect in this book and the writing is beautiful too so classic if this isn't a classic already like come on get with it I just want rules for being a girl to be taught in schools that's it especially that we are living in like a post or like we're in the me too world right now of women who should feel comfortable with speaking up and speaking out um yeah this book is every girl needs to read this book here's a new book challenge show us a book that you bought because of book talk show us a book that got you through a reading slump show us a book that gave you a book hangover Show us a book that you wanted to throw across the room. Show us a book that made you believe in love. Show us a book that you could reread over and over again. Show us a book that you could not finish. Show us a book that is marketed as YA but shouldn't be. Show us a book that didn't live up to your expectations. Show us a book that is spicy. Show us a book that deserved a sequel but didn't get one. And finally, show us a book that isn't hyped up enough. So yeah, I think we get the picture only in the small uh, videos and uh, I encourage you to look into it yourself to try and understand future customers and attract them. Uh, thank you, Michaela. The point is, uh, don't um, make a opposition, don't oppose uh, your book world to that funny uh, new media world. Uh, there are always new media. I remember uh, that I came across the term of new media in the 1970s when I was a kid and uh, videotape was a revolutionary new medium back then. Uh, and we have seen many, many, many generations of new media. What does this mean for a publishing company? Uh, it means that you need to adjust your production processes in ways that allow you to react to whatever happens. Uh, that means Mia has uh, uh, mentioned the, the, uh, the point already at the, at the very beginning. Uh, print runs that used to be the massive limitation of what is doable as a publisher and what is not that relevance of print runs has disappeared under one condition. And that is that you set up your processes in a way that you can retrieve the, the file of a book at any moment, that you have the rights to the book so that you can deliver it in any format and that you have a production uh, a process in place that allows you, if it, if uh, if necessary, to produce a book at a print run of one copy. Uh, that is not so difficult and so complicated and certainly not so costly as you might imagine, because over the past ten years or so, uh, print on demand has become not only um, um, a fulfillment. Uh, option that allows you to, uh, uh, to, to avoid the warehousing cost. Uh, it is now a complete strategy of fulfillment that uh, gives you the flexibility, even for a small press, to operate in a targeted way from a small uh, print run, uh, one order at one bookshop somewhere in the country, up to suddenly one title exploding and uh, selling more than you expected. And you can fulfill that unexpected demand in a, in a, in a simple way. And that's the last video with a statement um, uh, that we prepared by Gerd Roberts, who is the, the CEO of BOD, Books on Demand. That's a company based in Hamburg in Germany. Uh, it's the, daughter company of one of the largest 
wholesaler in the German book industry. And uh, they started as a wholesaler to understand 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that it was not good enough that they acted as a distributor of books that came from publishers, but that they needed to go the, uh, in, uh, the, the extra mile by offering both self-publishing services because they wanted to have the authors publishing with publishers and the authors trying to self-publish and that they also need um, to, to extend the service of fulfillment uh, to have any option available uh, that uh, um, a retailer, for instance, might want. And I ask uh, Dejan to launch uh, the last video on POD with Gerd Roberts, please. POD has been offering print on demand to publishers in uh, all across Europe for 20 years now. So this is really our thing and we know print on demand since the very early beginnings um, when obviously the challenges were quite different uh, from today's challenges. Uh, today we are dealing with a technology from a printing point of view that has been uh, uh, developed to a very high level um, over the years um, and even more importantly uh, it's the integration of print on demand um, within the logistics and the book distribution environment has been really pushed to a level where this is a technology that has become key to any publisher who, um, who seeks to um, uh, to adapt to, uh, to, the, to the big challenges that there are. And Jesus mentioned some of them, obviously the smaller print runs, uh, the uh, smaller order sizes, all those things, they require flexibility. Uh, they require uh, a high speed of reaction and you, you get to the point where you can't do this manually. You need to set up systems that are performant and that can meet the demands of the markets. Getting started doesn't cost you anything because uploading the titles uh, and making them available um, is obviously something that uh, doesn't have a price attached to it, that's free. Um, obviously, when it comes to printing, we print um, at a print run of one, so on demand. Uh, we don't have minimum print run sizes. We make the books all available and we print them as soon as the order comes in, even if that's copy one. So yes, this copy is obviously um, more expensive than uh, when you take one copy from a large print run. Um, however, and that's the challenge where we work with all our publishing clients. Um, obviously, it's a question of um, of making a, sustain a sustainable calculation here. Um, you save a lot of money on the processes. You don't have to, um, uh, you don't have the, the, the financial risk of printing a large print run and not selling it. You don't have a lot of logistics costs that come with it. You don't have to store the books forever. You don't have to destroy the old books. Um, so when you look at the overall process, um, it has become, from a pricing point of view, a very competitive um, technology, not for all types of books. Um, I mean, let's not hide the fact that um, POD obviously also, um, from, from a, um, a production point of view, still has some limitations. Um, you, um, but um, but when you look at a lot of the tiles, especially the more you go into, excuse me, the more you go into the backlist, uh, it becomes a very cost-effective way of having all the titles available. So these are the examples that we prepared. Uh, in the meantime, I wrote in the chat of this Zoom call um, a few notes to all of you. Uh, with uh, the names of the people that we quoted, with a few of their websites, etc., and the contact for us. Uh, but now, perhaps back to the moderation and to questions. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So many really exciting examples what is about what is going on. But um, tell me something, you guys. Is it just me? Um, because this these TikTok presentations really stay with you, a sort of. Someone yeah. should actually do a research how TikTok affects a grown-up mind, if you know what I mean. Uh, um, now. Let's not let's not talk about the books we have seen uh, in the TikTok. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sort of critical of all of them, not critical at all. But uh, do we understand this TikTok that all teenagers are using as a really serious tool that could be used in the immediate future? Um, Rediger, Michaela, Micha, does someone want to pick up on that? Michaela, um, I think. Uh... Uh, I think that TikTok is uh, a great possibility, uh, like I said, to um, to get to know your uh, your customer. I um, don't think that it will replace uh, future marketing um, on a whole, but you have to keep in mind that this audience is now learning that they are all, they are, that they are getting everything served in uh, videos. And instead of uh, demonizing um, Netflix and co, other subscription channels uh, and social media, um, not mattering if it's Facebook, uh, Instagram, or even TikTok, you should embrace the possibility. Yeah. And maybe start to use it too. There are only a few um, booksellers who've picked up uh, the trend I just managed to find um, one bestseller TikTok list uh, at Barnes and Noble's um, website in the US. But in Europe, there are no chains, and no one has picked up on this trend. Okay, and, thank and you. They, mm -hmm. yeah. Did you want to end, add something because I um, interrupted I, you? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to add that, of course, I displayed there in the video uh, the main genres uh, which are discussed, yeah, like uh, young adult fiction, um, uh, romance, novels, sci-fi, etc. But uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot going on also in other genres. There are um, teenagers in Italy um, impersonating Dante Alighieri. There is uh, there is even a, a, a young um, a young woman from Slovenia who is uh, reciting her uh, most favorite poems. So uh, a huge variety of possibilities how it can be used. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, so much. Uh, Let me add Mika one thought. Redinger, do you want to uh, Yes, add I, I would want to, to add uh, one thought. Um, we said earlier in, uh, in, in this morning uh, that it is getting more and more important to get a reading of your audiences. And I say audiences, yeah, and not one audience. You don't have one audience, but you have more and more segments that specialize. And you can have, as Michaela mentioned, uh, with that Dante Alighieri uh, or poetry uh, uh, residual uh, examples, you have people who, on the one hand, might be a fan of uh, fantasy fiction and at the same time have um, a, a, big, uh, a big love for, for, for modern poetry, for instance. Yes, But you will need to understand the many, many different segments uh, of their, of their um, uh, gustos, of their tastes. And, um, navigating through these diverse media is a perfect and very efficient means of starting to understand who these people are, what make them tick, and what, what, what tonalities, what colors you may need to offer them in order to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rediger, by the way, thank you for the li links to the companies and platforms mentioned. 
I mean, you don't have to be a publisher to be really interested in all these things that you mentioned in uh, your presentation. Micha, do you want to add, up, uh, add something to this? If not, we have an exciting question. Uh, maybe Micha should answer it first, and then uh, we'll um, give a word also to Redinger <coughs> and Michaela. Yeah, we, we got a question from Blas Jaklevich, who is asking, um, <clears throat> If uh, books are considered to be a, a thing for the elites, could this social perception trickle, in, trickle into physical reality in which physical books do become a commodity for the elite, whilst the rest of normal readers shift into digital? Well, I would say here it depends what you consider as an elite and what you consider as a normal reader. But what publishing statistics are quite clearly showing is that the main reading and audio content which is consumed in digital format is genre fiction it's uh, crime fiction it's, it's romance fiction it's fantasy fiction it's a lot of self-help stuff in short the the something what in, uh, somebody who is an elitist reader would call light reading and this quite clearly walks hand in hand also with uh, findings in reading research, namely uh, a huge set of studies has shown that uh, when we read uh, long form uh, informational complex content, we understand it much better when we read it from paper than when we read it from digital. So simply put, what is becoming digital is light content and what is staying predominantly on, on paper it's it is more complex content um so the answer is yes uh, uh, the, the majority of readers is shifting uh, to, to to digital and if you would ask me this question 20 years ago uh, i would say that uh, this elite of book readers will stay as an important social group but today i'm not so convinced uh, because long form reading is something deep long form deep reading is something what gave birth to critical thinking it's something what simply put appeared in in the light of, in the time of enlightenment and which actually was a dominant model of reading and learning for about 300 years but if you look today at the curricula at universities and at schools, this deep, long form bookish reading is disappearing or is better put shrinking. So I'm not sure whether these elite readers will be considered as a kind of a bunch of funny freaks, something like a, a, a club of steam engine lovers, or will this group of people who will still be reading long form content on paper be considered as an intellectual elite which sits on the on the top of uh, uh, educational structure and pyramid as i said if you would ask me this 20 years ago i wouldn't doubt how to answer but now uh, as somebody who is a uh, trained in social science i have of course my personal preferences but uh, uh, as somebody who is trying to analyze what's going on around me i'm not so sure if i know the answer to to, to the question what will this elite be in future mm -hmm. things are moving so quickly actually that we might actually get to see what the answer will be isn't it micha Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Can I add, uh, yes. Uh, I want to oppose um, Mia, at least Super. here. Yeah, we always uh, do have this kind of conversation. <laughs> uh, because I think, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that the steam engine uh, is not uh, the right um, metaphor for the book reading. Um, one little indicator would be a Berlin-based startup, which is fairly successful, uh, and its core audience is not steam engine engineers, but uh, the bright and glitzy who in professional life are 
very busy to, uh, working in other startups, working in big corporations, being immersed in digital conversations and, and uh, information all the time, uh, and yet feel an urge to keep up with what is published, especially in nonfiction literature. And uh, Blinkist, uh, I post the uh, website, uh, makes short, compact summaries of these books. And uh, personally, I think, so you can absorb the key information, the key points of a 250, 300 uh, page uh, book of nonfiction in uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and I'm, they are successful. They have an audience which is not steam engine, but uh, <laughs> digitally driven. And, uh, and I guess many of these people would, uh, will then buy more of these books, probably even in paper, after getting hooked by that uh, small spoon feeding approach at first. So what I'm saying is that again, uh, is emphasizing that segmentation. Uh, we will all become more specialists, uh, specializing in different ways to, for instance, uh, approach books. And the, the, uh, I'm convinced that the most successful book operations will be those that um, reinvent themselves continuously for feeding that old matter which are books and even printed books to ever new people and uh, meeting ever new consumer habits. Well, thank if uh -huh. I, if yes. I just met, uh, add here uh, one short sentence. Of course, I don't think that the book is like a steam engine. Uh, uh, nevertheless, the book is a machine which works well for 500 years. It's, it's a miraculous information tool. What I was uh, thinking about, uh, and perhaps was not clear enough before, are the debates which we have in Slovenia now in the educational environment, where there are people who say in our educational primary and secondary environment, we should use just digital learning tools. And this year we have huge debate whether reading one fiction book per year in fourth graders in secondary uh, 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 level is too much, and th 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 this is this is a this is an, a kind of an environment in which people who still read uh, books become seen as a kind of a, of a, 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 let's say strange old fashioned old old fashioned freaks. But but my, my point is we are not. The, the only problem is that this view of seeing book as one of very important informational tools in the huge set of contemporary media is being to an extent under attack. I'm not, of course, uh, saying that books should, uh, that all the other media should disappear. What, what, what I'm saying uh, in order to preserve intellectual uh, 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 strength. All, all what I'm saying is that we need to find a new place for books in this digital landscape. And I still believe that long form focused deep reading is one of the main pre preconditions from, for critical thinking. We haven't found any other way to develop this kind of intellectual abilities. Unfortunately, we live in societies where the forces which oppose this kind of seeing of book reading are surprisingly strong. That was my point. Mm -hmm. At Full least agreement. down here in Central Eastern Europe. <laughs> Please allow me to squeeze in another question or actually comment that is coming from our audience. Maida Koren has written, uh, but don't you think all the junk will go online and only the best of the best text will be published in books? Trees will be very happy. So who would like to pick up on that? Maybe Michaela? Um... Okay, uh, I don't think so. 
<laughs> in short, in short, I don't think so. I think, uh, uh, of course, books will always be published, but I think that consumers will get more and more selective of uh, what, uh, which books they buy and uh, which books they really want to have uh, standing around in their home and decorating their bookshelf. Um, and there are, uh, there, yeah, you can observe trends online on uh, different social media platforms where um, young people are um, encouraging others to buy special editions because they are glittering and because they have a relief cover and because of the cover art, of course, that's also really important. But and I think that uh, educational publishing will shift more and more to technical devices, of course, because it's fairly easier to uh, to carry around a Kindle or a, a tablet and have all stuff together than to have a big library and, uh, and small children um, having to carry uh, big rucksacks uh, to school. Um, yeah, but uh, on the whole, I think, uh, of course, books will always be published. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michaela. I, I would just like to add that, uh, yeah, uh, let's hope the school books will get digitalized. Some of them already are, but those rucksacks are still so heavy. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, I'm not sure we have another question. I would like to, to have one, but um, um, wrapping up, um, shall I just ask, uh, Maybe uh, we, we had a word from Michaela, which was quite encouraging. Uh, let's have a final word from Micha and Redinger. I'm asking you for a short wrap up because it's already 12 o'clock and five minutes and it is time for us to, to finish today's event. Uh, let's start with Redinger, please. Uh... Let me... Uh, let me conclude with a very, very banal observation. Um, we are partly living in a small village, um, which is really a community of most people being not very well educated. It's a very countryside, country pumpkin type of village. And um, a year and a half ago, um, we, um, uh, we initiated that there is a book trading opportunity introduced to that village uh, in the form of a cupboard in a, in, a, in a public place where you can deposit the books that you don't want anymore and where you can uh, retrieve free of charge books that you are interested in. And after a year and a half, that is a very lively and still very uh, lively uh, operation where we see we could, uh, on the one hand, uh, find many more people both serving the cupboard and, 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 you, uh, and taking out books and, and bringing books than anyone would have expected in the beginning. But at the same time, uh, we have a stock of solid uh, remainders that not go away no one is interested in these books anymore. And some of them have been big best-selling novels 30, 40 years ago. So there is much more transformation and much more appetite for new options than any of us would have expected. Thank you. Micha, do you want to oppose Rediger, maybe. No, not, not on this one. I mean, we have similar uh, boxes, which we call Knigobeznice in Slovenia. One is quite close to my house. <laughs> so I'm following what's going on there. And I have quite similar observations than, 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 than Rediger. Uh, I would just say that we, you know, we, we, we live in extremely interesting times when media are changing. Uh, for last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. And I firmly believe that the books will find their place in all these uh, new surroundings. 
I believe that uh, printed books will keep their place, even in, in school backpacks, uh, some of them. Uh, what we need to do is, is just to find the, 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 round, the right ways how, 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 how to do it. And those who will try, those will find the way. It's, it's always like that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Rudiger and Michaela in Vienna. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you, Micha. And uh, dear audience, let's not forget that that was only the second day of our uh, The Future of Publishing online event. Tomorrow, we also have an exciting agenda. Micho Kovac will host a debate on creatives and authors. He will be talking to two very successful authors, um, both very successful in different formats, and both searching for new ways to reach the readers. Uh, we are talking about Noah Charney and Kamenko Kesar. This debate will be followed by the presentation of good practices by Petra Slanic, uh, who also have great expertise in the area of marketing and PR business. So thank you for your attention uh, today and see you tomorrow and have a nice day. Bye, thank you so much. Bye.